There was a grandfather that was being audited by the IRS. And he decided when he went in to get his audit done that he took his attorney with him. And they sat down with the auditor and the auditor is looking through grandpa's uh, paperwork. And the auditor is very puzzled by this. He says, you live in a very extravagant lifestyle, but you have no full-time employment. Where do you get all your money from? And grandpa, with that hesitation, said, gambling. And the auditor was just shocked by the gambling, you know, like he admitted this to me, you know. And, and the auditor said, well, you're gonna, you might have a hard time with the IRS over this. And grandpa was undeterred. He said, I'm a great gambler. And he said, you are? He said, you want me to prove it to you? And the auditor said, why not? So grandpa said, I'll give you a thousand, I'll bet you a thousand dollars that I can bite my eye. And the auditor's like, what? And, uh, and so he, it was impossible to do. So uh, he said, you're on. And so grandpa took out his glass eye, put it in his mouth, bit down on it and put it back in. The auditor's going, great. I've just lost $1,000. How am I going to do this? While he was still mulling this over, Grandpa said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a chance to win your money back. I'll bet you $2,000 that I can bite my other eye. Now, the auditor knew that he was not blind, that this eye must be working. And so he said, deal. And so the, the Grandpa took out his false teeth, his dentures, and put them up next to his eye and bit his second eye. And Grandpa said, that'll be $3,000. <laughs> the auditor thought, dang, what am I going to do? $3,000. And so while he was thinking about this, Grandpa said to him, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a chance to win back all your money, double or nothing. The auditor said, okay. He said, I'll bet you I can stand on your desk and take this glass, this full glass of water and toss it over the desk into that trash can without spilling a single drop. $3,000, double or nothing. And the auditor was thinking, there's no tricks here that grandpa can do this time with eyes and dentures and all that stuff. And so he said, deal. So grandpa stood up on the auditor's desk, reached down for this large cup glass, glass of water, and threw it up into the air and water went everywhere. Came run, running down on top of the auditor, his desk, his papers, everything made a complete mess of things. And the auditor was laughing hysterically because he realized that grandpa had lost the bet then he had just recouped all his $3,000 that he had lost. So he was euphoric. But then the auditor looked across at the attorney and the attorney was, was sitting there just so disconsolate and he put his arms on the desk and put his head down like this and just shaking his head. The auditor said to the attorney, what's wrong? He said, oh my gosh. He said, just before we got, when we walked into your office, grandpa bet me $25,000 I could spill water all over you and you would be happy about it. Now, there's a certain kind of joy or several different kinds of joys in that story. Uh, that is not the kind of joy we're going to talk about today. Uh, over the next six weeks, we are going to unpack a single sentence. And this single sentence is our theme for this year. And I have a feeling it may be our, be our theme from this point in our church life onward. We exist. And there are six words that we're going to unpack. We exist to enjoy and share the love and message of God with everyone. That's our theme for the year. We exist to enjoy and share the love and message of God with everyone. We exist to enjoy and share the love and message of God with everyone. And today we're going to look at that first word, enjoy. Uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, probably like, unlike any author I've ever read, uh, is an amazing writer, um, Christian theologian from uh, last century. And he had some, some tremendous insight about this topic of joy. And it's not the kind of joy that uh, you and I typically think of, uh, sort of that euphoric, happy joy, like sitting in the auditor's room because things are going so well for you. Uh, C.S. Lewis went through some very painful times in life, including the loss of his wife uh, to a very painful cancer over a long period of time. 
Through those experiences, he wrote two amazing books that, all, that, that, that describe something of what kind of joy is it that God wants to give to us. Um, one of the books is The Problem of Pain, and the other is Surprised by Joy. Uh, these are two tremendous books with great insight. And there are a few quotations or insights from these books that I wanted to share with you just to kind of give you an idea of, to try to, to, try to describe not the kind of joy that we typically think of, which we refer as happiness, but a different kind of joy that joy is trying to build into us both now, into the future, and then eternally in heaven. So one of his probably most famous quotes is, joy is the serious business of heaven. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to take our hearts that are disjointed and, and far off the, the path of what we're supposed to be, uh, seeking some other kind of joys somewhere else, and he's trying to dismantle all the ways that we think and act and say that lead us astray and to try to get us back onto the right path of the kind of joy that only he can give and the kind of joy that we long for. Joy is the serious business of heaven. And he says, all joy reminds us of something. It is never a possession, which is just such a, such a great insight. It reminds us of something. It's always a desire for something, either something long ago or something coming up forward or something far in the distance, a longing he describes as joy. It's not the possession of these things. It's the longing for these things. Uh, not something within to hold on to. He said the moment that you look inside to sort of enjoy that joy, it disappears as a feeling. That's not the kind of joy that he's talking about. It is the byproduct of something outside of me related to God, something that I desire and I long for, something he calls an inconsolable longing. It's that thing, that, that yearning in your heart that nothing else will satisfy. And yet you're aware of something deep that should be satisfied and ought to be satisfied. Something that's not yet fully enjoyed, but will be. This is another way of looking at this kind of joy. Joy is not the thing itself, but the desiring of the thing, of that for which we desire and the desire itself. So um, today, what I like to look at is this thing of enjoy. When I think about joy, um, one of the things I think about is that typically as Christians, we are so used to dealing with our, our, our desires that are out of whack that it's easy to sort of lump all desires into this out of whack category of desire must be bad. And that's not the way the Bible describes desire. There are obviously some desires that are bad and ungodly, but there are some desires that are good and godly. We are made in the image of God, and God has desire as well. There are a few verses in your handout that I'd like us to look at. In Psalm 51, after David committed adultery with Bathsheba, Psalm 51 is his mea culpa about this. And he's describing, he's asking God for uh, forgiveness of sin and confession and mercy and for God to cleanse his heart. In verse 16, he, he prays, for thou hast no delight in sacrifice. You hear what he's saying about God? There are things in which God takes delight, things in which God desires for his people. Thou hast no delight in sacrifice. Were I to give a burnt offering, thou would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. This is something that God takes delight in. There are things in which he wants us to take the light in, in his character and in who he is. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, um, God speaks to Jeremiah to tell the people. And I love these two verses. God says, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight. God has a heart that delights in good desires that he has within himself and that he's trying to place in you and I, which can bring delight not only to ourselves, but to him and to the people 
in our life. Uh, on the inside of your handout, uh, why do we not experience this kind of joy more often? Uh, one of the reasons is, is that we naturally, in a bad way, just sort of assume and believe that there are other things that would bring me joy more than relationship with God. For Christians, oftentimes, we look at God as sort of the keys to joy, the keys to blessing of the, the kind of joy that I really want, whereas in actuality, that even though God gives joy and he is the key to blessing, uh, there's nothing more important for joy than God himself, his presence and relationship with him, his, who he is. Joy is not just that he gives joy, but that he is joy. He's the person of joy. He's trying to draw us into a relationship in which he becomes our highest joy. That's hard work, and it takes a lifetime of God's working in you and me over a long period of time to slowly bring that to pass. Now in your hand, that are some of my favorite verses uh, that describe this. Psalm 27, 4, one thing David says, I have asked the Lord, one thing have I asked the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. If he had one request, David says, this is it. He continues, for he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. That's, those are some of the songs that we just sang that Bart so masterfully uh, picked for us today. That God sings over us, and we have the opportunity to respond back by singing to him out of joy. That's what Psalm 27, 4 through 6 is about even in the midst of the difficulties of war where David found himself. Psalm 63, there's a meta, God, David uses the metaphor of a desert to describe living in this world. And that there are times where we thirst for something and what we're thirst for, we cannot, cannot quench our thirst. Psalm 63, oh God, my God, how I search for you. How I thirst for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. How I long to find you. How I wish I could go into your sanctuary to see your strength and glory. For your love and kindness are better to me than life itself. How I praise you. I will bless you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. At last I shall be fully satisfied. For I shall be in your presence. You see, the highest thing that David sought for with joy was relationship with God. And he was searching for it, thirsting for it, even in a world where it seemed like a desert to him and there just wasn't enough water that his soul needed. Psalm 42, one and two. David says, as a deer longs for flowing streams, so longs my soul for thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? The joy that David's describing there has to do with the longing to be in the presence of God, not the experience of joy, and the experience of the presence of God. That is a really, really important distinction for you and I as Christians. It is the longing for God's presence that provides joy quicker than the experience of joy in God's, uh, the experience of his, of his presence in joy now. In my own life, the experience of joy of God's presence is fairly rare. The longing for God's presence, the desire, that can be something that you tap into every day. Psalm 1611, that has shown me the path of life. In thy presence there is fullness of joy, in thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now why is it, even knowing these things, why is it that somebody like me or somebody like you finds joy so elusive? Well, there's some reasons for that, and the Bible talks about that. Um, the, the heading for this is sin, is that sort of structure inside of us that leads us astray over to this road instead of his road. And it's things like that we may not even be aware of. Um, we decide what kind of joy we'll be happy with 
and what kind of joy will not suffice. And we decide when joy ought to happen rather than leaving that up to God. Uh, we naturally just assume that other people ought to cooperate with me having the joy that I want. And when they don't, we get mad at them and sometimes we get mad at God. All of these things just sort of naturally happen in our, in our human nature. And God has to expose these things and bring them to light and get us to a place where we repent and turn to him as our greatest joy. Uh, Romans 7, 21 describes something of this battle that goes on within the heart of every Christian along these lines. Romans 7, 21, I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. There's this tug of war inside of me every day, every day, back and forth. I delight in the law of God in my inmost self. That's true of the Christian, whether you're aware of it or not. That longing is put in there by God. But I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin, which dwells in my members. These two laws competing back and forth in my life every day and in your life every day as well. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the only solution to this problem. You can try anything else, everything else you want to, to change your human nature, and you're going to find it doesn't work, not for very long. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with the flesh I serve the law of sin. Even though sometimes temptation seems so compelling and so strong, there is in the heart of the Christian a deeper desire, the deepest desire is to know God and reflect him to the people in your life. But that desire is usually so buried with blankets and other desires we think more important that it's hard for us to even see this. But this is what God is trying to arouse in the hearts of his people. One of the most famous uh, sentences about joy comes from the book of Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Uh, and it's kind of one of those sentences that you, look, you think, wow, that's a good sentence. I like that. And then you think about it for a second. Well, what does that mean? The joy of the Lord is my strength. One of the neat things about uh, being a Christian, I think, is that before I was a Christian, when I thought about happiness, I always thought about happiness and sadness or happiness and struggles as sort of either or. Either you're happy or you're not happy. Uh, but when I came, when I came and, and as I lived that life, after a while, I got so tired of being happy for a few days a week and, and just sort of blah for five days a week. Um, and I thought, I did not want to live this way the rest of my life. Well, what's missing here? For the Christian, we have the power to have those days when you, are, you feel blah, when you're dealing with anxiety, when you're dealing with fear, you're dealing with sadness or grief. But at the same time, that, that does not mean that joy needs to be absent. Rather than an either or life here, what the scriptures describe for us is, is, a, is a both and at the same time is possible. Both and. And this is illustrated uh, in two stories that we're going to finish today with. The first is the story of Nehemiah. When Nehemiah... The story begins with him in uh, Babylon, and he's uh, an exile. Uh, Babylon had come and devastated uh, Judah, had laid waste to Jerusalem, uh, had taken exiles all, all back off to Babylon, and Nehemiah found himself as the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. Word comes from that land to Babylon, and when uh, Nehemiah hears the word, he is just devastated with the news. He says that the city is in rubble. The stone walls have been broken down. The houses have been burnt. The people there who are, who are left as a remnant have nothing. And there are enemies all around. And he is just heartbroken when he thinks about this because he remembers what the city used to be like when the people followed God. And this whole thing of judgment was so needless. And yet the people stubbornly held on to their way of life and how they wanted to live their life in spite of repeated warnings from the prophets. Nehemiah hears this word, and he is heartbroken. He, the, the, the book of Nehemiah opens with him fasting and praying for three days. 
And finally, he goes to the king, King Artaxerxes, and he tells him what he would like to do. And amazingly, King Artaxerxes gives him the go, go ahead. You can go back to Jerusalem. You can leave being a slave here. You can leave being exiled. You can go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall. Well, Nehemiah has nothing to do that with. And Artaxerxes says, we'll fund it. And then he knows that there are going to be bandits on the way back and pe bad people who are going to try to take advantage of Nehemiah and the, the people that go with him. And he says, well, if you need, uh, if you need help, uh, uh, we'll, we'll provide soldiers for the way back. Amazingly, Nehemiah goes back. He talks to the men uh, who are there and they start to rebuild the wall. All the men themselves take this project on. All the while, while they are getting all kinds of criticism and, and death threats and threats of war and attack from the people all around them. It is, it is a, the, the whole situation here, it's hard to fathom what it would be like to be in this situation. Maybe if you thought about being over in the Middle East right now, maybe uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an American uh, in the land of Iran, uh, in Tehran, uh, and think about the danger all around you. That's sort of what Nehemiah was trying to do and the threats of war as they're trying to rebuild this wall. Well, over 52 days, they got it done. In spite of some of the drama between the people inside and the threats outside the wall, they got the thing done and it came time for a day of celebration. And Ezra, the priest, brought out the book of the law and read the book of the law in the city square for all the people. And when the people heard the book of the law, which they had not heard in a while, the scripture says they all wept. And I think they wept for different reasons. They wept because they realized none of this needed to have happened if they had just obeyed God in the first place. Uh, and yet they also wept because in spite of their sin, the story was not over and God brought a remnant back, uh, exiles back to the land and they rebuilt the city walls and they could see that the hand of God was on Nehemiah and on this project and that, that, that their life was going to, to go forward. They wept because of this. And it's in this context that now we have this famous verse that, that, that you all know so well. Um, Nehemiah 8.10. He says, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. This is not a day for mourning. Enjoy safe, uh, choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This is not just about us enjoying because, you know, God has provided for us. But find some folks who, who need food and who need sweet drinks. He says, this day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah undoubtedly needed strength from the very first day he heard about the desperate situation in Jerusalem and had no resources with which to do anything about this until the day of talking to King Artaxerxes and going back to Jerusalem and talking with the leaders and having to all the manpower coming from the remnants that's there in spite of the, the threats, 52 days of threats, where many of the days Nehemiah describes that the workers had uh, a, a, a spear in one hand and a tool in the other because attack was imminent at any time, day around the clock, day and night. Now, amidst all of that stress, huge problems, mammoth danger, he says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I think what he meant is the joy of the Lord was my strength through all of this time, and is my strength today. It's not the kind of joy where we're just kind of off in our favorite place, like the, the Esmeralda over in Indian Wells, enjoying coffee and swimming in the large pool and reading Sherlock Holmes. And, you know, it's not that kind of joy. It's the kind of joy in the midst of heartache and trouble and struggle and danger, anxiety and fear. There's something that's available even in the midst of those circumstances that Nehemiah says, that's what kept me going. God is telling his story and we're a part of it. In that sense, he could tap into that kind of joy even in the midst of all kinds of difficulties. 
The second story that strikes me when I think about joy is, is from the book of Zephaniah. Just a short little book, three chapters. Uh, the first two and a half chapters are rather discouraging to read because Zephaniah talks to not only Judah, but also the nations surrounding them. And it's a, it's a, it's a uh, passages of judgment on virtually every nation in the Middle East and goes into some detail about why judgment's coming for each of these different nations, including Judah. And finally, by the time you get to the last chapter, chapter three, about the middle of the chapter, uh, the story changes for Judah. We'll pick up in Zephaniah 3.14. It starts out with, sing, sing. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Why? Well, we get a little clue there when he says, daughter of Jerusalem. He's talking about their identity, what we call identity. We sang about this this morning, too. I think it might have been our first or second song. I am a child of God. It's our identity. That's what he's describing here. O daughter of Jerusalem. A daughter, a son of God, me? The Lord has taken away your punishment. This is why you can sing. He has turned back your enemy. Another reason why you can sing. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Another reason you can sing. Never again will you fear any harm. A fourth reason you can sing. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. In the midst of what could be discouraging situations, um, and every day in my life, it seems like I, I deal with discouraging situations. Uh, in spite of that, uh, there's a joy that's available. It's possible to sing even on discouraging days. Verse 17, again, one, this is one of the most famous verses in Old Testament prophecy. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Again, what Zephaniah is describing here to the people through God's word to Zephaniah to the people is when God thinks about his people who have been through judgment and who are now restored back to right relationship with him, they have a chance to look at God and he sings over them. When I think about this, I think about when our, when our kids were little. Sometimes they were in, uh, I remember thinking about being them in the, in the crib, asleep, and going in there, and just sort of looking at them in much the same way that he's describing here. There's just a joy just looking at your, your kid, sleeping. And the idea of singing resonates. You're thankful for this little, this little bundle here that's, that's sleeping. You're, and you're thankful that they are sleeping. Uh, that's the image that he's describing here. Verse 18, the sorrows for the appointed feasts I will remove from you. And then in these verses, he describes four particular plights that probably every one of you can identify with. I could certainly identify with you. And in these four plights, he describes what he's going to do in spite of these four plights. Um, I will remove from you. They are a burden to you, plight number one. And they are a reproach to you, plight number two. At that time, I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame and gather those who have been scattered, plight number three. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they are put to shame. Plight number four. Now, what is he describing here? After he's described singing over them, what I imagine is them thinking, well, you're singing over me, but, but I've done some really bad things. Things of which I have shame and reproach over and burdens that I have brought upon myself and and, I, and I've made messes of, of, with people in my life that, that have scattered people. Uh, and what God says in these verses is something along this line. What you brought shame upon, I'm going to turn to a glory. The burdens that you feel like you have to carry, that you brought on yourself, I will carry. 
third thing is that the reproach that you feel on your own life about what you've done in your past, he says, I will redeem. This story is not over. There's, there's beauty that's going to come out of this story, even in your reproach. And the, first, and the fourth one is that even if you have scattered those from, because of something you've done, says, I have the power to help them return. These are reasons to sing. Uh, verse 20, he finishes this passage. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. That's the story of joy for us Christians. It's not just joy in this world, but the joy that's coming. When we'll finally be home and that inconsolable longing will no longer be inconsolable. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. Now, one of the images that he, that he uses in this passage is that of singing. Singing in our culture is sort of a lost art. We don't really hear much singing uh, unless you're a, a soccer fan of the, uh, over in England and you know, these teams in the Premier League each have their songs that they sing and, and they sing them very, very loudly when their team is winning. In case you hear uh, songs at big college football games you know, the, or, uh, or pro games where the fans are singing because a touchdown was scored or, or they just won the game, pulled it out at the last minute. Uh, but in our general culture, you really don't hear that. In fact, I, most of the time in my life, I don't hear my, that much singing live other than here than when I go to an Angel game or a Dodger game and you sing the Star Spangled Banner. But even there, most of the time, it seems to me that most of the people listen to the, the person on the microphone sing the Star Spangled Banner. Every once in a while, you hear a few people just sort of mumble under their breath. Oh, say, can you see? You know, you know, you know I'm old enough to where I'm, I'm out there blaring it out. You know, I don't care anymore, you know, at my age. That's good. <laughs> That is a good thing. <laughs> but one of the things I remember is what happened after 9-11. The World Series was going on. It was in New York. Yankees were playing. And one of the first days, I think not the first day, I think it was the second day after, I think it might have been game five of the World Series, they had Lee Greenwood come out at home plate with a microphone and sing the famous I'm Proud to Be an American song. They had a camera right up there, right in front of him, and there were cameras panning the group, panning the stadium. If you Google that this afternoon, Lee Greenwood, Yankee Stadium, 9-11, and you're able to listen to that whole thing and watch it without a tear forming in your eye, I want to hear this. Because then I'll know to pray for you. There's something about song. There's something about singing that takes cognitive truth that's up in our heads and sort of plants it down in our soul. That's why we sing and worship. We don't sing just because there's nothing else to do before Seth gets up to speak. Singing is my favorite time of what we do. I need it, and I need it every week. Now, that's the metaphor at which Zephaniah finishes this story. Notice in verse 14, it starts with, he tells the people, sing, and he gives them the reasons to sing. But the best reason to sing is he finishes this passage in verse 17 with, he will rejoice over you with singing. When you think about this year, we exist to enjoy and share the love and message of God with everyone. This piece of joy that God is working day and night on his people is, as C.S. Lewis says, is the serious business of heaven. It identifies who we are and why we are made. Joy. Let's pray together. Father, I pray 
that your people could hear the words that you're speaking to them and the lyrics that you're singing over them, even now. We sang some of them earlier today, but would you penetrate hard, stubborn hearts that insist on having a different kind of joy that we get to define, and that we experience on our timetable? Would you break through all that junk that just comes so naturally to us and invite us once again to your presence, to experience a longing and a desire for joy that we just will not find anywhere else. It's most clearly seen in Jesus Christ, who died because he wanted to, to make joy possible for us.